And where we're picking up today, we're actually going to see Paul address two main beliefs that were mal-influencing the Christians of the Colossian church. Mm-hmm. And these two bad or mal-influencing or these two bad influences on the Christian church of Colossae, they're called Judaism and Agnosticism. Mm-hmm. Judaizing Christians were a group of people that would actually follow Paul wherever he would plant a church so that they can confuse and sway members away from the gospel message wow. of Jesus Christ. Wow. So if you've ever had haters, trust me, the best of them do too. Their argument pretty much was, if you want to be a Christian, you have to convert to Judaism first. And if the new Christian was from Jewish descent, meaning he was a Jew, what they would tr- what, what they would try to tell this new Jewish Christian, it would be like, leave the Christian stuff aside and, and you got to reconvert back to Judaism. Mm. They basically believed that Jesus alone was not enough. Wow. They wanted Jesus plus the law. They wanted Jesus plus the rules. They wanted Jesus plus their traditions like circumcision which we will not get into. So this is the first group, right? The, this is the Judaizing Christians. Then the second belief came from agnosticism. So agnostics were a group of people that believed that creator God, God, our God, was a very distant and separate God from his creation. They believed that creator God made other gods who made other gods that made other gods. And one of the lesser gods created the earth. But the main creator God... Um, he doesn't connect with us. He's too far. He's too good. The main creator, God, he doesn't relate to our existence, our humanity. He doesn't relate. He doesn't connect. He's completely disconnected from us. He's relevant to us because he's just so, so, so far away. Um, these agnostics, when it comes to Jesus, the most dominant belief in their faith or in whatever it is, I think you can call it a faith because they have, they, they know there's uh, 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 di- an extra dimensional being. They know that there's a, a super higher power. They just haven't made up their mind of who it is. So th- they, they believe and they kind of don't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to Jesus, the most dominant agnostic belief is that Jesus was just a spirit. Wow. That he didn't really have a physical body because he wasn't really a man. He was just a physical spirit that would appear. Now, the Judaism or, or the Judaizing Christians, what they believed was that Jesus was just a man, but he was not spirit. Wow. So the, the, these two strong beliefs were confusing the hell out of the Colossian baby Christian church. Wow. You have the agnostic saying he, he was, Jesus was just spirit. He, he's not a man. And then you got the Judaism, uh, uh, Judy, Judaizing Christian saying he, he, was, he was just a man and he was not a spirit. And so Paul's going to write something very powerful. And this is where we're picking it up in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. Paul gives us a very powerful statement. He says, for God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Mm -hmm. So through this one little line, the apostle Paul is telling those in Judaism, Jesus wasn't just a man. Jesus was God. Because God lived inside Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he's also telling the agnostics, God isn't far He isn't a far distant, disconnected God. And he's not disconnected from his creation. He actually became human and he lived among us because God loves us. So in other words, Paul was saying, Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. So through this little line, he attacks these two worldviews that were confusing the Colossian church. And then he moves on, verse 20. He says, and through him, God reconciled, and we underlined the word reconciled because we need to understand what that means. And through him, Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. The first thing that we need to understand is what is reconciliation? Reconciliation means to be in right standing with. Or in our case, it's to have friendship status with God. Mm -hmm. So we were not in a friendship status with God when we were born. You were born in a sinful nature. It is God's nature to consume sin. So we were not right. We had no right standing. And so when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, what does God accomplish through the blood of Jesus on the cross? Reconciliation, meaning a reconnection, meaning a friendship was established all over again between us And God. Okay, so God is letting you know that reconciliation comes from Christ's blood on the cross. Mm -hmm. If it comes from his blood, 
then that means reconciliation doesn't come from our good behavior. Uh, It's not about what you do, man. Uh It's not about how good you are or how bad you are or how many things outweigh the bad that you've done in life. Being in right standing with God is has little, it has nothing to do with you. And it also lets us know that reconciliation does not come from spiritual enlightenment, which is a very popular belief nowadays. To be enlightened, you, you, you find enlightenment from within, which is totally the lie, the biggest lie that Satan ever spoke from the beginning of time. He, what, did, what, what did Satan lie to Eve with? You can be like God. It's, it's to look within and not above. And, and, and Paul is trying to say reconciliation with God, to be in right standing with God, has nothing to do with how good you behave. It has nothing to do with your actions. It has nothing to do with your ability. It has nothing to do with your moralistic behavior. It has nothing to do with anything that you can do in your own willpower. And it also has nothing to do with spiritual enlightenment, which is what our entire generation, those that are spiritual, are really enthused about. And so what Paul writes next, is to expose our need for God. So he's clarifying Jesus is 100% man and he's 100% God. And then he speaks about reconciliation with God, which comes through Jesus and not through you. Say it with me, not through me. me. It's through Jesus Christ's blood. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's That's where we find reconciliation. Not through spiritual enlightenment, not to look from within, not to reconnect with mother nature, None of that garbage. It's through one thing. The blood of Jesus Christ. And then right here, what he's about to write next is to, he's he's here, he's going to expose our desperate need for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then he says, verse 21, this includes you who were once far away from God. So he's talking about, in verse 20, he's talking about reconciliation with heaven on earth, God did it. And then he says, verse 21, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. So this reconciliation includes you. And Paul gives us three things to point out how much we really need God. And if you paid attention and if you read it on the screen, the first thing that he says was this, you were far away. We were all born with a desire to be the Lord of our own life. Listen, we really dislike the idea of someone ruling and governing our life. We dislike that. That's why so many people do not surrender to Jesus because they understand that surrendering to Jesus means that he will now govern your heart and he will rule in your heart. And we were born with this thing where we don't want to be governed. We don't want to be ruled. We have grown in a sinful nature with pride. That, that does not permit us to surrender our heart, to surrender our decisions, to surrender our plans. That's why it's a work in progress to come to a place where you actually surrender your entire life to Jesus, not a, an entire moment, an entire life to Jesus. Wow. Now, the problem with being our own Lord instead of Jesus Christ being the Lord of our life is that we begin to chase things. Woo. We begin to chase created things. And I'll tell you where everything falls under. There are, there are three categories where everything that you chase will fall under. Money, power, pleasure. Which pull us away from God, especially when these things turn into sinful things. Yeah? Yeah. When these created things, because remember that we spoke last week that all created things were created by God. So all created things were good. But when you take a created thing and you take it out of God's order, that created thing becomes an enslaving thing. Yeah. You you remember that from last week? I hope you did. If you didn't, well, I just reminded you. (laughs) And so here's the problem. When we chase created things like money, power, pleasure, these things pull us away from God. And they pull us even more away when these created things become sinful things in our life. God created these things for our enjoyment. And these things should lead us to gratitude and worship towards God. But when we chase created things and give them the glory instead of creator God the glory, we end up empty and void. We end up empty and void. This is why you can see People that we deem in our culture successful commit suicide. Wow. Because they were chasing the things that you're possibly living for. Preach. They obtain them Preach. at great amounts, all to what? Emptiness and void. Wow. 
This emptiness and void then causes us to chase more created things to feel satisfied, which leads us into a vicious cycle of chasing more and more and more created things instead of God, thus taking us further and further and further from God. See, it's a vicious cycle. You chase created things, you're empty and void. So because you're empty and void, you want more of the created things that you were chasing. And when you're empty and void, after chasing and chasing, chasing, you, you, you get into a vicious cycle and say, oh, that was not enough, so I guess I need more of it. Oh, that was not enough, so I guess I need even more of that. Yeah. All the while, you are legit taking steps further wow. and further and further away from God. Wow. This then takes us to the second thing that he mentions. You were his enemy. You were God's enemy. So he says you were far and you were his enemy. Because if you're far away from God, you'll be chasing created things. But when you chase created things, you will not be satisfied. And this unsatisfaction easily turns into hostility in your mind. Wow, wow. That's crazy. Because we know this. You know this, I know this. When life isn't going right, we look for someone to blame. Uh, true. This is just how it is. Yeah. This is how it's been. This has possibly been the narrative of many chapters of your life. Usually we blame it on those around us too. But most of the time, we like to look at God and blame God. Wow. And so then Paul says, you were separated by your evil thoughts and actions. And this is the third thing. So you're far away, hostility in the mind, and this leads to you being separated by your evil thoughts and actions. So chasing created things leads to unsatisfaction. This then leads to a hostile mind. And having a hostile mind with hostile thoughts will almost always lead you to evil actions. Wow. The more you think about something, the more it manifests. Yeah, you know this That's because you contemplated certain things in your life over and over and over again. And they weren't even an option. They were just a temptation. But the more you entertained the temptation, the evil thought, what was never an option has now become an option. And then two months later, after not taking those evil thoughts out, you're caught in it. You're doing it. Because chasing created things leads to unsatisfaction. This leads to a hostile mind. And having hostile thoughts will always, always lead you to evil actions. And it's interesting because... When we live empty and unsatisfied, that void lifestyle becomes a justification for evil and sinful actions. It's almost like we like to trick ourselves and think, well, since I had a bad life, I guess it's not bad if I fill in the blank. Wow. Let me give you an example of this. Sometimes maybe you had an empty void life when it comes to your relationships. Maybe it could be your family or your, your, your significant other, right? And so because you've had... Um, a, a bad experience with, with, with your parents or your family or a loved one, you use that empty void, right? And you say, since I've suffered, then it's okay if I cheat on my husband. Since I've done, or since I've been in a troubled home, then it's okay if I live in resentment and unforgiveness. Mm. Or, or, or for example, since my boss is not nice to me and I don't have the recognition that I want, oh, then it's okay if I steal a few bucks from his company. Oh. We trick ourselves because our evil thoughts turn into evil actions and we go, since, since I've lived a life of void and emptiness and it's not gone my way, then I guess it's okay. I guess it's okay for me to fall. I've had a hard week, so I'm going to binge on all that ice cream. I'm not going to have a cheap meal. I'm going to have a cheap week. And, and, and you justify and appease yourself into sin because you allowed a lifestyle of emptiness and void become your justification. And here's the mistake that we've made as Christians. When we see people do bad things, we tell them, you need to change. Stop doing those bad things. But the problem is that evil thoughts and actions are just the symptom. Yeah. The root is 
they're far away from God. That's the root. You can try to use willpower and say, I swear I'm never going to do that again. (laughs) How many of you have done that? But it's just a matter of time before the root shoots up more fruit. If you don't tackle the root, it's going to spring forth more fruit. And so some of us sometimes are in a situation where we're saying, I I swear I'm never going to click on that website again. I swear I'm never going to meet up with him ever again. I swear I'm never going to have a cheat week like that ever again. I swear. And you think that your willpower (laughs) is the root, but you're just treating the symptom. The root of all the evil thoughts and actions that we sometimes live (laughs) is found in one problem. You're far away from God. So thankfully, that's not where Paul concludes this. (laughs) He gives us a solution in the next verse, and we will see you here next week. God bless you. Just kidding. (laughs) Verse 22, it says this, and I love this part, okay? Because you, you got to read this with me, okay? Read this with me, okay? Because this is going to teach you so much, okay? He says this, but now God. Someone needs to say in the chat, with rest in your soul, thank God my life change does not begin with me. It begins with God. I mean, type it in the chat. It doesn't begin with me. It doesn't begin with me. It doesn't start with me. It begins with God. But now God, see, your transformation begins with God. Your life change begins with God. Your healing in the heart, in the mind, if you have a broken mind, it's, it's not through your willpower. It's not through your behavior modification. It's not through your morality. It starts with God. And that's what the Apostle Paul says. But now God has made you his friends again. And that's the word reconciliation. This is just another version. He did this through Christ's death in the body so that he might bring you into God's presence as people who are holy with no wrong and with nothing of which God can judge you guilty. I don't think they understood this. So I'm going to read this one more time because this should be Crave Church's favorite Bible verse. So listen to this one more time. But now God has made you his friends again. He did this through Christ's death in the body so that he, he might bring you into God's presence as people who are holy. People, he, he wants to bring us into his presence as people who are holy. Watch this. With no wrong. And with nothing that God can say you're guilty. Do you understand that? God, God, through Christ's death, wants to bring you into his presence, call you his people, and without any charge of guilt. Even though you are imperfect, you're sinful, but through Christ, God can't charge you as guilty. This verse is the gospel in a few lines. This should be our church's favorite verse because you don't have to do anything to change yourself. You don't have to do anything to transform yourself. You don't have to do anything to fix yourself either. You only need to be reconciled with God through faith in Jesus because Jesus Christ did everything. Jesus Christ did anything. The only thing that we have to do is believe and place your entire life on that foundation. Hey, if I die, who the hell cares? I'm covered. I'm covered by grace. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. I have nothing to fear. So many people fear death or even the topic of death. They're afraid of dying. But we as Christ followers who have placed our hope, our trust, and everything that we know into the hands of Jesus Christ who bled for my sins, who paid my debt, who washed me clean from my shame, I can stand before God in confidence knowing that I am forgiven. I don't stand guilty. I stand free. This 
is the gospel. So when we're trying to behave well, when we're trying to fix our own sinful nature through our own strength, you're walking on the treadmill of stupidity because you're walking but you ain't getting nowhere. Trying to fix yourself up. Trying to fix and modify your behavior. Trying to get it right before you get close to God. You know what you're doing? You're on the treadmill of stupidity. Because we all know that you can walk on a treadmill. But you ain't going anywhere. And that is what it's like to try to fix yourself. To try to heal yourself. To try to lift yourself up from your own shame. You can't do it. You may be walking, but you ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. So when God calls you to salvation, through the gospel message, and you give your life away to Jesus, this solves the problem of you being far from God. But if you want your mind to be transformed, then you got to get closer to God so that his light can transform your thoughts. It's one thing to be saved. And there's another thing to be transformed through that salvation. So, so how do we get transformed and how does our mind get renewed? How do we renew our mind? You get close. And how do you get close? You get close through reading his word. Come on. Through actually praying. Mm -hmm. By actually pausing your own life worship and you worship God. Because yeah. yeah. a lot of you are worshiping yourselves on Instagram. Yeah. A lot of you worship yourselves at the gym. Can't even work out because there are too many mirrors for you. <laughs> a lot of you worship yourselves by a number on a bank account or a GPA. And so how do you get close to God? You actually read his word and say, I want to fill my mind with his word. Drop the Harry Potter books. Pick up the word of God. Come on. Make time yes. to pray. Some of you are like, I don't have time to pray. If you don't have time to pray, you're doing way too much. Mm. And worship God. Yeah. Church yeah. is a way to draw close to God. Yeah. Church, this is what we call your devotion to God. Mm -hmm. It's when you start drawing close to God and you separate time for him that your life and your mind begin to transform. When you do this, this will begin to transform your mind mm -hmm. to God's likeness. So and all of a sudden, the way that you view life will be healthier, yeah. wiser, yeah. more spiritual, right. more loving, mm -hmm. more merciful. Yeah. You'll see others the way that God sees others. That's You'll true. serve them, not use them. Your mind will be renewed. And when your mind is renewed, so are your actions. Wow. Wow. Good. All right. I wish I can preach a little longer, but I want to get to the main point. And that's verse 23. This will happen. What, what's the this that he's talking about? This is the reconciliation, that right standing before God. This will happen if you continue strong and sure in your faith. You must not be moved away from the hope brought to you by the good news that you heard. That same good news has been told to everyone in the world. And I, Paul, help in preaching that good news. So here's the condition. This reconciliation, which is to be friends with God or have right standing before God, only stands if you continue strong in your faith. Mm -hmm. So this means that this reconciliation is for those who have truly placed their hope in the gospel of Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, our heart is always revealed through a crisis. Oh, mm -hmm. That's true. That's yeah. true. Your true heart is always exposed. A trial will always expose your real heart. Because you'll either run to God knowing that he's good no matter what. Or you'll get angry with God and you'll leave him. Those who have truly placed all of their hope, all of their trust in Jesus, come what may, they'll always run to God. And what Paul is saying is this. This reconciliation will always stand. It will always stand in effect for these people. The ones who have truly given their life. The ones who have truly been saved. And so, I'll tell you what this verse does not mean. This verse does not mean that you can lose your salvation. And let me explain a couple things. We've been consumed and we've been entangled by the gospel of works instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where works 
and behavior have become the anchor of our faith. This is what we call religion. God's word tells us that we've been saved by grace through faith. For works. Works happen after we're saved. Jesus didn't bleed and die on a cross so that you can then have to work and accomplish what he was supposed to accomplish. Anytime that we say that, you know, you can lose your salvation, that, that, that's so contradicting to the word of God because we're saved by grace as a gift, yeah? And if it's given as a gift and God gives it to you and it's freely given, unmerited, you have it as a gift, but then you can lose it and the only way that you can keep it is if you work for it. Mm. How many sins does it take for you to lose your salvation? Mm. Wow. Wow. What types of sins take for you to lose your salvation? And here's what John MacArthur said. If you could lose your salvation, you would. <laughs> because none of us are perfect. You, you could never be good enough to maintain what only grace can. So we've swapped the gospel of Jesus Christ with the gospel of works. You better be careful. Don't go to sleep because if you go to sleep and you don't pray, you're going to die and wake up in hell. I used to be afraid of going to sleep before when I was a kid because I'm like, what if I wake up in hell? There's no assurance in thinking that you can lose your salvation. Mm, yeah. That's not hope. Mm -hmm. That's fear. Uh, wow. God's word tells us that we've been saved by grace through faith for works. Works happen after we're saved. Works are secondary to our faith, yet we live through a lens where works are primary to our faith. Mm -hmm. wow. And a lot of that garbage has crept into the church. And this is what was happening so true. in the church for the Colossians. They were being pushed towards works, towards the law. And you got to get circumcised because if you're not circumcised, God can't receive you and you're not saved and you're not truly, you know, born again. You have to do this and you have to keep this rule and you have to do that rule and fulfill this. Yeah. Works are secondary. Works are a means to an end, but not the end. Works aren't the foundation to our faith. Jesus and his grace Hallelujah. are. Hallelujah. And so the Apostle Paul writes one of the most famous passages that you should know, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9. And it tells us this. God saved you by his grace mm -hmm. when you believed. Not when you performed. Woo. When you believed. And you can't take credit for this. Did you get that? Because yeah. it's a gift from God. Hallelujah. Salvation is not a reward for the good things mm -hmm. that we have done. On, so none of us can boast about it. And then he mm -hmm. puts a period right there can't boast about it. It's a gift given to us by God. And literally it says, it's not a reward for the good things that you have done. Wow. Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Stop trying to perform. No, I'm not saying that you deliberately go sin and be like, oh, thank God I'm saved. I have a green card to do all the whatever I want. Paul actually writes and says, does that mean that we have to go and sin as much as we can so that the grace of God can um, uh, amount to large amounts? No, of course not. When you're saved, you're transformed. So your desires are different. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. You don't Same. seek those things that pull us away from God because your priority becomes being close. Yes. So anything that pulls you away from God is something that you walk away from. Yeah. Then the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatian church in chapter 2, verse 21 to re-establish the gospel of Jesus and says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Mm -hmm. Paul saying, keeping the law, which were all the rules. Yeah, all those rules were good because they help us understand how sinful we are. But if keeping the law could save us, yeah. if doing all the good stuff could save you, if all your works can keep your salvation, if all your works can keep your salvation, if all your good deeds could keep your salvation, if all the good behavior that you make could keep your salvation, Paul's saying this, then there was no need for Christ to die. Wow. 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 You flip Jesus from being the savior to you becoming the savior. Oh. That's why this whole thing that you know, we're reading Colossians, is, it's not saying that you can lose your salvation. Hell no. Because Jesus is eternal and he gives eternal life to those that have been saved. And what is eternal life? It means that once you have it, it's yours forever. Yeah. And so when it comes to the law, I, I, I wanted to show you a clip. And I was going to preach it, but I think Pastor Gary Hammer can preach it a lot better. And he mm -hmm. gives a beautiful explanation mm -hmm. on 
this whole entire topic when it comes to the law, which is all the rules that we read about, and when it comes to grace. So here's this clip. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious. And then there's a semicolon there, so let me just pause here. What does he mean by talking about this statement that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels? Well, here's the deal. Um, Technically speaking, the law was given to define right and wrong. If you happen to do what is right uh, well, then you don't really need the law that is breathing down your neck. In other words, let, let's say, for example, that you, you really don't have a problem with stealing. Maybe, maybe you got some other issues, but stealing's not one of them, right? We all have some kind of issue. But let's just say for the moment that stealing is just not one of them. You, you, just, you, you have never stolen. You don't have an interest in stealing. You don't want to steal. It's just something that you, 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 know, you just don't do. So do you really need to know the penal code, the criminal penal code for stealing if in fact you just don't steal? No, the penal code is given for people who are thieves so that they know this is wrong, you got to stop doing it, and there's consequences. So in other words, what he's saying is that for the righteous, for people who obey God, you don't really need the law, it's for the unrighteous. And Galatians 3.24 says that the intent of the law was put in charge, Paul writes in Galatians 3, to lead us to Christ, to bring us to Christ, so that by faith we might be justified. Do you know what happened in Jesus' day was that the religious leaders were using the law as a means to get to God instead of realizing that the law was a mirror that exposed their sinful condition. So the Pharisees, instead of looking at the law like a mirror that kind of reflected their sinful condition that then hopefully would make them cry out for a Savior, instead they looked at their sinful condition and they saw the law and they thought, well, I just got to make myself better and improve on this so that I can get closer to God. They missed the whole intent of the law. The law was not a cure. The law was just a mirror, or another way of of saying it is that the law is like a thermometer. It doesn't cure you, it just shows you that you're sick. You take your temperature, you know, when you're sick, you take your temperature with a thermometer. You know, nowadays they they have the the whole thing that you just kind of whisk it across a child's forehead, and now that, but back in my day, it was the mercury thermometer that your mom had to shake before before she's, hopefully your mouth, uh, sometimes, you know. (laughs) We've come a long way, baby. All right. It's your forehead. How dainty is that? But at one time, it was very invasive, like, you know, like, like a pat down at, at the airport or so, you know, it was, um, but a temp- you know, when you take your temperature with a thermometer, the thermometer has no ability to cure you. The thermometer just shows that you're sick. The law is in, in, this, is in the same way. It had no ability to cure a person. Well, if I just obey the law and keep all the commandments, then I'm good to go. No, 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 no. The law was to show you how sick you and I are, and then when it exposes our hearts, then it causes us supposed to, cause us to cry out to God, we need a Savior. Thus, Jesus enters the world, and He dies for our sins because we could never live up to the righteous standard of the law, try as hard as we might. And there are a lot of people today who still are trying to be really, 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 really good persons because they really want to be good people because they really want God to love them and just to like them. And the fact of the matter is God already loves you. God so loved the world in all of our sinfulness that He gave His Son Jesus to die on a cross. You you can't, by your good conduct, improve on the love of God for you, okay? But the problem is it's an exercise in futility because if you think that you can just be good enough, good enough, good enough, and then God, you can somehow get favor, none of us can be good enough. That's why we need a Savior. There's none righteous, none of us, no, not one. So God sends a Savior, Jesus because of his love for us to die for our sins. So this is what Paul writes to the Galatian church. And listen to what he says. If you try to be made right with God through the law, your life with Christ is finished. Watch this. You have left God's grace. Do you see how wrong it is for us to actually think? It depends on you. Remember that 
when Jesus died, he took all your sins into account. All the sins that you premeditated, he took them into account. He took account all the sins that you did not see coming into your life. Because there are moments where we're caught up in a moment of weakness and we fall. We weren't planning it. We didn't want to do it. But we were weak. And if you don't stand on grace in those moments where you sin, the devil, you become such an easy prey for the devil to turn you into a condemned soul. Even though there is no condemnation for you. But if you believe a lie, it becomes your reality. See, Jesus took all, look, look, dude, look at me. All the stuff that you're about to do tomorrow, next year, in 10 years, Jesus already paid that. Wow. Come on. He took you, he took everything. Thank you, Lord. Everything into account for your life. Come on. When he was nailed on that cross and bled for you. Wow. He reconciled you forever. Yeah, so here's a, here's a heart check. The question shouldn't be, can I lose my salvation? The question should be, am I even saved? Because mm, wow. <laughs> there's a change in the attitude of your heart when God calls you to salvation and you genuinely respond. Some people think that they're saved because they grew up in a Christian home. Others think they're saved because they attend church. Others think they're saved because they got baptized as an infant, which is a practice that we don't practice at Crip Church. Yep. We believe that baptism has to be a choice that you make yeah. Yeah. because you're repenting from all the messed up things that you've done mm-hmm. that you've recognized are sinful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And others think they're saved because they're good people. Yeah. <laughs> Salvation is a transformation of the heart. You go from rebellion towards God to a pursuit towards God. In other words, the transformation takes you from running from God to running towards God. Come on. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's what salvation is. It's a transformation where you once rebelled against God. Yeah. You, you, you did not want to go to church. You did not want to pray. You did not want to seek him. You did not care about his word. You lived as your own God. Your opinion mattered and that's it. God's opinion, you, I could care less. You, that, that was a life of rebellion. But when salvation enters the heart and it's genuine, that rebellion turns to pursuit. Yeah, that's right. And so instead of running away from God, now you're running towards God. You're desperately seeking God. Amen. Salvation brings you to a place of desperation for God yeah. because it opens your eyes to how much you really need Him. Yeah. Yeah. So, good. so look, if you can sin, live a life that is contradicting to what Jesus died for. If you can do things that break the heart of God on repeat and not have a broken heart after that, you may need to re-examine your salvation experience Yeah. because you may not be saved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I went to church all my life. doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah, but I serve in the church. doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like I can sing. I sing in a choir. doesn't matter. If you're doing a whole bunch of stuff that's contradicting to the word of God, breaks his heart, and you feel no remorse, no conviction, and you can wake up the next day like, La da la da la, I'm all good. Mm. You're not saved, man. Mm. Because a saved soul has a transformation of the heart where when they do something that breaks the heart of God, it breaks their heart too. Yeah. Wow. So if you're not saved and you want Jesus to save you, the prayer that I want you to make is one of asking God to take you to a place where you see and feel your need for Jesus. So we're not going to make a prayer like, I receive you as the Lord and Savior of my heart. I receive you as the Lord and Savior of my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. That's not the prayer we're making. Yeah. Right now we're going to make a prayer. And the prayer is, God, take me to that place where I can see Come on. and feel that I desperately need you. Yes. Forgot to take you to a place where you're genuinely stirred to be saved. Mm. See, without revealing, without God revealing all of this to you, then this just becomes knowledge, but not a reality. 
You need God to open your eyes, to touch your heart, and allow you to see your need for salvation. Mm. And that only his Holy Spirit can do this. So let's pray for God to bring you to that place. Because yeah. only the Holy Spirit can. Yeah. Yeah. The place where you see and feel the need to be saved. So that when you ask him to save you, it's legit and not just a religious repetitive mm. prayer. Come on. Close your eyes with me. And if this message spoke to you, we're not going to spend a lot of time here. Because you're just going to make a prayer request to God. Yes. And that prayer request, I want you to repeat it with me. And repeat it with your words. But attach your words to your heart and your mind. So here we go. If you can, ask him sincerely. Father in heaven. Father in heaven. May your name be kept holy. Be kept holy. You, are mighty. you are mighty. And you are powerful. You are powerful. Blessed, be Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, in this moment, God, in this moment I, recognize I recognize that I need you. That I need you. So, take me to a place so take me to a place where my affections, my, affections, my heart, my my soul, my soul. May, they all be stirred may they all be stirred to ask you to, ask you to, save, me. to save me. Transform, Transform. My, mind. my mind, my heart. My heart. Unveil, Unveil my eyes. My eyes. Help, me see Help me see how much I need you. How much I need you. Help me feel, Help me feel. Desperation, desperation to call on you. And the name of Jesus only. And the name of Jesus only. To save me. Save. Please. Please. Save me. Save. I'm, yours. I'm yours. Save me. Save. In Jesus' name I pray. Jesus name. Forgive my sins. Forgive my Cleanse sins. me. Cleanse Wash me. Wash me. Change, me. change me. Transform me. Transform. In Jesus' name I pray. Jesus name. Unblind my eyes. Unblind my eyes. Unveil, my eyes. Unveil my eyes. Help me see. What I cannot see. Help me see my need for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I pray that as you made this request to God, that you may live this week, this week, live in tune, in tune to hear Him. Seek Him this week. Be like, place in me, you can repeat part of this prayer. Or just play it back and repeat it again. This video will stay here on Facebook. But this week, seek God. If you've not been saved, or if you were saved, um, or, or you were in a church, grew up in a church, but you walked away from faith, and, and, and you believe that your salvation experience was not, it was possibly not genuine, you need to make this prayer and seek God and say, God, 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 please let me see that I need you. Because, listen, you can religiously repeat this prayer and not be transformed. Yeah. So, so God has to impact your heart in some sort of way. He has to reveal himself to you. He has to like touch your heart. Yeah. So that you go like, oh my God, okay, I get it. <laughs> I felt it. You, you need an experience. In other words, what we call this an encounter with God. Yeah. And, and the simple prayer that you repeat just verbally, because the preacher told you to repeat it, that's not an encounter with God. Yeah. You need God to touch you. Yeah. So this week, live, live, live on purpose. Be intentional about seeking him and hearing him and say, I need you to become real to my life. Yeah. Not just knowledge. I, I want you to be real. I want to experience you. Yeah. Amen. Amen.